Hi there. Thank you so much for coming to my presentation. Um, as I'm recording this, uh, we are in a time where we don't yet know who the president is, and I'm certainly feeling that anxiety. I'm hopeful that when you're watching this presentation, things are a little more settled. But if they're not, I think uh, starting with the breath is a good way to go. So if you want to take a big, deep breath in, let it out. <sighs> I felt good. You can keep breathing like that the entire time of this presentation, anytime you need it. Highly encourage it. But if you're ready to get started, my name is Ellery. My preferred pronouns are she and her. I welcome and invite you to use your preferred pronouns when you're speaking out in our inter interactive part of this session or to rename yourself so it's in there as you pop up in the chat like we can in Zoom. I believe we'll be able to do that through this app as well. And welcome to moving from George Washington slept here to who cleaned this chamber pot redefining school programs to meet 21st century learning and teaching. First, I'd like to get to a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that the land we exist on, even in this virtual space, is the original homeland of many First Nations people here in New England. We further acknowledge the painful history of native genocide, as well as the stain of slavery on our public and private sites that we work in. We respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land and endeavor to learn from our violent past. I would also be remiss and not wielding my power correctly if I didn't speak to what's going on with museums and historic spaces right now. Uh, both are dealing with two major issues, a global pandemic that everyone is dealing with and suffering from, and radical racial and social inequality that has been going on, uh, arguably, as long as museums have been in existence. But many more of those stories are being shared and we're becoming more aware that that's a, a much larger problem for our industry. So there are lots of different ways to help. The first that I mentioned here is to amplify. By that I mean raise the voices of other people and of these conversations that are happening. You can do that by improving the algorithms for social media like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the more you like something or share something, the wider that gets shared by their own uh, programming. So tapping into those conversations, sharing those voices, speaking out yourself uh, based on your experiences or sharing your platform with somebody else can also be really helpful. And if you're in a position to financially donate, there are many relief funds going on out there that you could help with. Um, that's just one option, but there's a lot of hardship out there if that's something that you can help with. And then below, I've got some accounts, some hashtags, some ways to tap into these conversations. If this is the first time you're hearing about any of this, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but these are some that I follow. I'm more of an Instagram person, so many of these are Instagram handles. I'll also share these in the chat as we're going along as well, so you don't have to um, write all this down furiously if you'd like to check all of this out. So a little bit of housekeeping about this presentation. So here you see a picture of two people. You see me and you see the lovely Mrs. Samantha Hunter Gibbs, newly married. Um, this presentation is based on the work, the passion, the ideas of two people. Unfortunately, only I am able to present. I feel quite honored and privileged to be able to do that, but I just wanted to have that reminder in there that there are two voices that you're hearing here. Most of the time, I'm always only speaking for myself. I can't speak for anyone else or any other groups of people. There's a few things that I can say, Sam and I share this view or feel this way because we've worked together and we know each other quite well now. And I may say some of that. Um, another note about this presentation, I'm pre-recording this. My hope is that this session has two components. It has this presentation and this PowerPoint, some takeaways, some tools, some things that I can give you or just talk with you about. And that will also have an interactive question and answer and discussion portion to this. If we were live and in person, that's certainly something Sam and I intended to have as a part of this presentation. We both love interacting with other people. We're museum ladies. We love to talk about museums. So it's also part of this presentation. Pre-recording this also enables me to be able to be live and in person with you during this session time and moderating the chat, answering questions. If someone has a really good juicy question, I may say, oh, that's really good. I want to bring that up to everybody. That'll be the first question that I raise. My hope is also that we could do some sharing out if you have gone through a process of change or updating educational programming and you'd really like to share about that experience, I would love to hear that. I'm sure other people would love to hear that. I benefit from other points of view and perspectives um, and learn from other people's examples. So we would love to have that sharing time as part of this presentation as well. But what we're gonna do today together, I am hoping to provide you with some tools to revamp your educational programming. 
I'd like to give you some solid takeaways, ideas to foster positive change at your space. I can speak more specifically to small and mid-sized spaces because that's where my experience lies. Um, Sam and I come from somewhat of a similar background, so I've got about four years of experience in the museum field. She's got about five, but both in those smaller to mid-sized spaces. My hopes and dreams are certainly that if you're at a larger institution, you have access to more resources, more tools, uh, more support, maybe a larger staff or a larger team, and that some of the challenges that Samurai have faced, maybe you're not going to face some of those challenges. That's certainly my hope. Please share if that's not your experience at a larger institution, and we can get into that, especially when we do our interactive question and answer time together and live discussion time. So it's okay to be entering things into the chat as we're going. Um, I will be able to monitor that as well as someone from NEMA. So that will be well tended to during this presentation. So don't be afraid to be like, oh, I've got something now and I might lose that later. Pop that right in there. Um, something else I didn't get to that I think is good, if you experience any technical issues during this presentation or other presentations, my best advice to you is to breathe and reboot and come back in and start again. That's another advantage of recording this. I'm also very happy to share these slides as a PDF. So you're not gonna miss that portion of it. Just come back in, you know, re redo everything and enter back in. We've all been there with technical issues, so no stress on that. So right away, I have a first takeaway, our ground rules. So these ground rules are both for our discussion time to give us a little bit of guidance and safety and how we talk to each other a little bit later in this presentation. But I also think ground rules are fantastic to do with students, especially younger students. I think it's a great way to set expectations right away, right at the start of your programming. And it can also give you an idea of where are you starting with your student learners and your student group. So for us today, speaking for yourself, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, I'm not speaking in generalization stereotypes, even if you believe them to be a positive stereotype, like all fourth graders are so energetic. We know all people are not all one way all the time. So keep it, keep it specific, keep it to yourself. That will serve us well, I believe. Share the air with each other. Um, if you've got a lot to say, that's great. We, I'm, I'm always happy to continue discussions and conversations uh, throughout NEMA week or really anytime, and I'll share my contact information as well as Sam's, which she has certainly allowed me to do for this, um, but that we'd love to continue those discussions if they're more in depth, but make sure if other people wanna share or have questions, we've got some time to get to all of that. Respect, that's a basic one. Uh, respect for each other. It's, it's a good one. We need it, we like it. Uh, and assuming positive intentions. We know intention and impact are different things, but I am absolutely assuming positive intentions for anything people choose to share out in this conversation or other conversations that no one is trying to do active harm here. And then for, for here, I've put for young scholars, I'm always looking for a good substitute for students, so I don't say kids. It can be demeaning, so it's just some language I'm playing with and trying to work around, so if I ever find good subs, um, even just ones that'll make you laugh, I've put them in there. I think it's a really good ground rule with students, especially younger students, to tell them right away the kind of programming you're gonna have. And most of the programming that I'm passionate about involves a dialogue and a back and forth. So I want to hear from students and I want them to know that right away. Uh, Sam and I both are famous for saying, I hear myself talk all the time. I would love to hear from you. I've never heard from you before. This is a totally new experience. So I think that's very important to put out there for students if that's your type of programming. If you have a different type of programming, you may set a different expectation there. And number two is playing the what's a museum game. So this is very much a call and repeat with students. So as soon as you start, you'd be like, where, where are we today? What, are we, what do you think we're gonna learn about? What do you think we're gonna do? And then once you get to, we're in a museum, we're in this type of museum, this is the kind of learning that happens here, you can also get into more behavioral ground rules and expectations depending on your site. There may be opportunity for lots of touching and interactivity and sensory learning, or you could be in a space where there's very little you can touch and you have to be quite careful that you're in a breakable area. So highlight and focus the things students can do. So you can say, well, there's, there's some things we can't do, but we can do this one really cool thing, and I will tell you when we're able to do that. I think that's really helpful and important. I would suggest you don't discount the possibility, the very real possibility that all or some of your students may have never been in a museum or historic house space before. And those spaces can be quite intimidating if you've never been there before. So 
also welcoming them in your ground rules, letting them know, hey, this is a place for you. We want you here. We're thrilled that you are here. And this is going to be great. And yes, we may see some things that look older, look breakable, but we want to be here and we're going to have a good time together, but also crafting the how to behave. So the behavioral stuff, I think you can get into as well, right in the beginning. Let's move my little slides here. All right. So knowing what's your why. So if you want to make any changes to existing or possibly longstanding educational programming, you're going to be asked why do you want to change that? So having a really solid answer and having your why really down about what you want to change, why you want to change it, what you think could be improved. I think knowing your core values for yourself as an educator and or for your institution, hopefully those values are in line most of the time. Um, if they're not, that may be something you need to sit with or push back on a little bit. But core values can really govern how you make change and why you make that change. That's so all trying to serve those higher purposes that you'd like to serve. Those could come from strategic plans. They could come from some existing documentation that's out there about your institution, your program, your museum, your space, and you can use that in your programming. I think setting realistic goals and a priority list are very important and can serve you very well. It's unlikely you will be able to change everything if you're in, if you have that kind of opportunity to build something from the ground up. I would love to hear about it. I think that's an amazing opportunity. I'm an agent for change, so that's not scary to me. That could be scary to some other people to really be starting from scratch. Um, but keep it realistic. If you like SMART, girl, SMART goals, if you like that acronym, um, that's a good one to help um, mold and shape your goals. You may have to prepare some proposals and some plans just to get the buy-in you need to get to the process of doing the work. So be prepared for that. Be familiar with your workplace culture. If it's a very formal culture, you may have to prepare a formal proposal and I've got some tools later that can help you craft that and make that a little bit easier. You may be in a different kind of institution and setting where you can just approach someone with your ideas and like, that sounds great. You know, flesh that out more and get back to me. And that's wonderful if that's a position that you're in. I also think seeing all of the seasons first is important. I think there is a lot of seasonality to museum education, a little less so in the world of COVID-19. But I think it is important to know how you do something, why you do something, and how it's been going before you talk about changing it, updating it, enhancing it. I think you need to see that and you need to have that foundational level. So I've got some sample goals, things I've desired to change in my career, things I've been working on that I think there could be some commonality with these with other institutions and other people. I'm always seeking consistency. It is problematic for me if there are six smaller groups of students going through a space and then at the end of the trip, they've all learned something completely different. I think that could work as an interesting model if you have built in time that you all come together and you share out about what they've learned and maybe students are teaching each other. I think that's very interesting and great. I've not always been in that position to have that kind of timing. So consistency in what educational outcomes we've come, we've gotten to, I think is really important. I think student-centered and focused learning is essential. I think everything you craft needs to be about the students and less about the space, that students should be central first to what you're changing. Moving away from white and American exceptionalism, very important to me. My job is not to tell the stories of a few famous white wealthy men in history. My job is to tell the stories of many people throughout history and be calling too many voices in, in history, in a space, whatever your field is that you're working in, I would watch out for things like that of really holding up a few people on a pedestal. I think that's problematic. I think there's been time and space for that. We've done that very well. And I think it's time to move forward from that. And grade specific programming, if you already have grade specific programming, awesome, fantastic. If you don't, it's something I would consider. I would encourage you to think about that and think about how could you be tailoring to the learning objectives for that grade, but also be making it specific to how those grades learn and how they behave. Third graders act differently than sixth and seventh graders. So I think having that in there and not having a one model fits all for all students approach. And now getting to the work. So I think asking for a retreat or brainstorming time is really important, especially if you're in, I, I don't know anybody who isn't wearing multiple hats at one time and having multiple tasks. 
I think it can really help to have some time to have clarity, be creative, and think about pie in the sky, what would you do if you could do anything? This is something Sam and I have asked for before. It doesn't necessarily cost money. I don't mean going on a fancy team building retreat where you're out on zip lines. I mean, can you be in a coffee shop for four or five hours, fairly undisturbed, obviously always reachable for emergencies, but can you schedule that time? Can you look creatively in the calendar and be like, oh, this is a great week where we're not going to have any school groups, nothing major is going on. Could we do X? And asking for what you need and what you think will help make you more successful. I think doing surveys is really important of teachers, school groups, homeschool groups, anybody that's come to you in the past. If you've already got an idea, you could craft your survey questions around what you'd like to do, or you can make it more general about what they'd like to see. What are the parts of the existing programming that they really enjoy and they, they keep coming back to? and really get that information and that data I think is important. I think seeing other sites and how other places do their educational programming is also um, quite informative and helpful. And in New England, we're, we're quite lucky that most places are a drive away, not a plane ride away. So it's easy to get to other places, reach out, make friends. Um, I've done it, I've gone to many places where I didn't know anybody said, hey, I would, this program is, seems really awesome. I would, I would love to come and shadow this, I think. That's something you'd be able to do. Researching and content bolstering. I don't know that you're gonna to have to do a whole lot of new research for what you'd like to update about your existing programming. You may have to bolster that content or look at your content in a new way. So you do need time to sit with that and think about what's really different there. But I bet you already have lots of fantastic, probably too much content than what you can get to in a 40 or 60 minute program and how to pare that down and focus. Creating written materials and guides for your programming if you don't already have this. So if something happened to you tomorrow and you're out of commission for a long time, are there written materials that somebody else can pick up and be like, oh, I can lead this program. It's got all the details, not an exact script. I'm not a script person, but a good solid outline. I think that's important if you don't already have that or making sure that's a part of enhancing your programming. And the last it would be to pilot it. I would reach out to groups in your off season, teachers you have a relationship with, um, maybe just friends and families you know with students in the age, with kids in the age range that you would like to be working with, um, summer camps. There's lots of different ways you could reach out and say, hey, would you be willing to bring your group, try this out, incentivize it, make it free. That's a good way to do it. Or say it's free, but you will have to do the survey afterwards because we need the feedback. Um, but making sure you have a time, maybe not a whole season, but you've got some time set aside to pilot your new programming, your ideas, and get the kinks out. That's really important. Rolling out and then moving forward with your changes, your enhancement, your improvements, however you want to look at that and call that. I think collecting and analyzing all of your data. So surveys, whether it's formal or informal, I, I like informal feedback and sometimes that is what you will get from teachers is right after the trip when it's fresh and like that was really great because of X. I noticed that this was different and I really liked that. I would catalog that in some way, write that down, put it in a, put it in a spreadsheet, I'm a fan of a spreadsheet, whatever makes sense for you. So you've captured that feedback in some way and you can use that later. Next, you've got to train it. So if you work with volunteers, part-time educators, full-time educators, yourself, I know there's every different size um, team out there, but make sure you fully train this before you have other people leading your new programming. For a while, you may be the person who's doing a lot of the leading and other people may be shadowing, and there's time for that. I think having a testing season is ideal. Um, whichever season maybe is a little bit slower for you, maybe fall or winter or some intercession time, so you've got time to make some additional changes. Once you've tried this out with real, student thing, real students, things are different when we have students in front of us. Um, so it's good to have that time in there. Advertising and marketing, I would say that also goes with getting the word out. So if you've made these changes, you've piloted it, you've tested it, you've, you've got all your documentation, your materials, people are really enjoying it and loving it, make sure you're sharing that with the rest of your institution, with your advancement team, if you have one, your development team, this could be tied to some development initiatives for fundraising if those funds are going directly to this educational programming. And make sure that you're advertising, you're marketing the changes you've made, you're clearly communicating that to teachers, especially if you see the same schools and teachers every season. Make sure they know something's going to be a little bit different this time, the next time that they come. 
and you'd love their feedback, but yes, you've made some changes. I think that's important. So here we have a little Padlet. This is just a little example of some changes that Sam and I have worked on together. I'm not going to go too in detail about this. I'm very happy to share this as a standalone so you can see it. It's just sort of laid out on this linear continuum so you can see how we started and how it went from there and then what had to change because of COVID-19 for some of our changes. We didn't get to all of those steps that we knew we wanted to, like some of the training and that final testing at the end that we really wanted to get to. This is a great resource. It's free. It's really cool. You can do a lot with it. We're going to get into that a little bit later. So I'm happy to share this Padlet. I may have already shared it in the live chat right now. And then here we have some benefits and some challenges, I would say, of changes I've been through before with educational programming. Some are kind of the same. So I think a small program, small number of volunteers who help you or part-time educators, whoever you're using, if that's a super small team, it's a benefit and it's a challenge. It's easier to train fewer people, but you're constantly having to run programs yourself. I think that's challenging. Um, money, it's a benefit and it's a challenge. So I think it can help if you can sell these changes that you wanna make as, hey, all it's gonna cost is, the, is my time, which you probably already pay for. And it's just me you know, carving out time in a different way to create this new programming. Um, but that can be a challenge if there's things you really want to do that cost money. So it's, it's a win and it's a loss. Some other benefits, a better variety of styles of learning. That's a big plus for me. Following shifts in education, some of the things that we've talked about, some of those example goals and desired changes I've wanted, we're kind of following those, change, change, those shifts in education. Um, more fun, more consistent, something I'm always looking for. And I think some of our programming changes that we made had some built-in flexibility that other people could step easily in as the facilitator and lead this program and still have a little wiggle room that there may be, you may enter one space in a museum. There's four things you could get into in that space. So I think it had some built-in flexibility. Um, challenges, I think a challenge for all educational program is sustainability keeping volunteers, recruiting new volunteers, part-time educators, staffing. I think that's always going to be a challenge. I think communicating change to returning teachers, which I mentioned in the previous slide, I think that's really important and will really help you out if you've over-communicated so they know it's going to be different. Hopefully that information has been disseminated down to chaperones and other lead teachers that are coming. Um, but if not, you've set that tone, but then once they arrive, you're just moving forward with what you've changed getting buy-in from leadership and other educators, that could be a challenge, especially if you're in a much beloved program. And if a board member had only seen a field trip from 10 or 15 years ago, now they've got something to judge it against. So I think that can be hard. Um, challenging and changing institutional traditions and norms, always challenging, always a little difficult. Um, so now I'd like to get into some more tools, takeaways. You also have a handout, which I'm gonna get into a little bit as well. So here we have a picture of lovely Samantha. Um, I can tell from the position she's in from this photo already, she is probably doing VTS with this lantern, which doesn't surprise me. So here we've got a few 21st century techniques, some strategies, some things I really encourage you to explore. You may be familiar with all of these, you may use all of these, but I think they're great and they work in multiple spaces. So visual teaching strategies or VTS. So there's some more detail about what that is, if that's newer to you or it's been a while since you've dived into VTS. That's in that handout there, which just got little explanations about what it is, why we like it, why we think it's a good idea. Dialogic styles. So moving into discussions with students or with all of your visitors and moving away from a sage on the stage mentality for educating that one person is speaking at the other people for a long amount of time. Moving away from that and inviting people into the conversation, into that dialogue and learning from each other's experience. Um, there's all different amounts of that you could do. You could have a percentage of dialogic styles that you're using, um, but I think any amount of having that interaction is fantastic. Interactivity, exploratory learning, touching, discovering things for themselves, fantastic. Figuring out what something is by themselves, great, wonderful. Sensory learning, I'm a big fan of. Any sense that you can tap into in your space, especially with students who can be very tactile. Great, fantastic. The only one I've not been able to use so far is taste, but I'm gonna find a way. 
um, think right learn approaches. This comes from Smithsonian Learning Lab, Smithsonian Educator Resources. So I would really encourage you to take a look at that. Just a different way to get the brain moving. And then aligning with academic standards or curriculum in your state. I think that can be really great, especially if you're trying to build a new relationship with a school district. You can say, hey, so we see that you have a civics learning standard that you get to for fifth graders. We can speak to that through this and having that formalized. So it may mean that you have to create programming that looks a little bit more like a lesson plan or something that's more digestible for teachers, educators, and leadership in schools. But I think that's something to consider, especially if you're trying to get new schools, new districts, new people on board and into your site. Um, some other tools. If it's free, it's for me. I'm usually working with a zero dollar budget, so some of these are free and fantastic. And that's why I use them. Mailchimp and Constant Contact. I'm sure somebody is using one of these to send out newsletters, emails to your members. You can use it yourself as well. So you can make your emails look very fancy and professional to your teachers, your volunteers. You can track it. It will give you some analytics on the back end so you can see who's opening it, who's looking at it, who's gotten that information. Highly, highly support that, encourage that. Smithsonian Learning Labs, if you're a part of a Smithsonian affiliate, some of this might be for free, some of it might have a cost. But they also have educator tools, which I think are fantastic, and that's what some of that other stuff comes from. Comes from. They also have um, a series about talking about race with students right now. Fantastic, I would check it out. Um, PictoChart and Canva are similar. They both help you create really cool graphics. You can make graphs and pie charts and just go bananas and make really cool stuff. It can also just help you make a little, you know, digital postcard, like, thanks for coming in this season. You know, we had a great time. Here's some pictures of the great time that we had together with your students. Padlet, which is what that little kind of digital memo board looks like. That's what it comes from. I'll share a little bit about Padlet in the chat as well. I think a major tool you always have at your disposal, visit other sites. Ask about it. Um, as a NEMA member, you can probably go for free or a steeply discounted rate. You could also make friends or buy somebody a coffee and then come and visit them at their sites and do some peer learning that way. So you are certainly welcome to continue this discussion, other museum discussions or topics with both Sam and I in real life. We would love to do that. Um, we, do, we have different social media preferences, but these are both of our emails. I'm more of an Instagram person. That's my public Instagram handle. Sam's much more of a Twitter person. I'm, I know very little, and that's the way to reach out to us. But we love to talk about all, all of this and more. So now it's time for our live question and answer discussion time. And I'm really looking forward to speaking with you in a couple of moments. I'll see you soon.